Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, um, Documenting Black British History with Brent 2020. Today is International Reggae Day, um, and we are here today to talk about the importance of documenting Black British history, specifically through the lens of Black British music history. Um, and today, our panelists and our speakers will speak to you about the different projects that they have embarked on and the research that they have um, created to document this truly important body of work. Uh, my name is Letitia. I'm with uh, the Brent 2020 team. Um, just a few bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, please use the chat box to, um, to introduce yourselves to each other, say if you're encountering any technical difficulties or anything like that. Um, use the Q&A box to send uh, questions through that we'll be answering towards the end. And then finally, we're also joined by Natalie here for BSL Interpretation. If you are following Natalie along, um, please do be sure to pin her video, which you can do by hovering your mouse over her video and clicking the three little dots and selecting pin video so that you can follow along as we play um, videos and audio clips. Um, but with that, let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to ask all of our speakers to just um, please say your names and, um, and your roles and who you're representing today. Zarita, let's start with you. Hi everyone, my name's Zarita Brown. I'm senior producer in the Brent 2020 team and leading on the No Bass Night Home project. Uh, Michael? <laughs> oh, I think you're still on mute. It works better when the mic's on. Um, my name is Michael Riley. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster and principal investigator on the Base Culture Research Project. And Selena, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everyone, um, I'm Selena Papa. I'm from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and I'm the Head of Engagement for the London and South area and particularly looking after Brent, Enfield and Newham in my role. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Zarita, let's start with you because really, um, you know, we, we wanted to create this event to look at No Base Like Home, which is um, the reggae archive and the focus on reggae um, that's been occurring throughout the year um, under your leadership. So can you tell us what is No Base Like Home? What does it do? Um, and then also we'll play a few clips from some of the work that's been produced. Yeah, sure, thank you. So No, no Base Like Home is the story of reggae in Brent. It's a story that if you've come from Brent and if you grew up in reggae, many people know about um, the legacy and the impact and the powerhouse that um, reggae had in, in the borough. But often reggae gets, um, Brent gets left out of the reggae story. Um, reggae is often associated with sound system culture, um, associated with like Notting Hill Carnival, and not necessarily really associated um, with the role that Brent played in terms of production, um, record labels, studios, um, record shops. So this project is a really about putting Brent on the map and doing that through working with the community to tell those stories, because it's a community that know these stories and helping us shape this project. And we've done that by creating um, an online reggae archive. Um, and um, the idea is that we have built this archive with the community and it's an archive which is sharing stories from reggae fans through to some of the reggae legends and pioneers and people that we very much would have grown up with, with listening to their music. Um, and it's available for everyone to go and listen and hear this story and hear, hear the stories of, of the community about reggae. Great. And um, yeah, just tell us a little bit uh, like why, why you felt like it was so important to be able to document this kind of history through, um, through oral histories. So reggae is a huge part of obviously the Caribbean diaspora, but it's also part of British history um, because when after Windrush, as, as we know, that happened in 1948 and we started to see many of the Caribbean um, community move over to the UK, many of the reggae community came and set up home in Brent. Um, and that was for a number of reasons, but the main reason probably being because Trojan Records set up in um, Wilsdon in 1968. 
Um, and it, and as I said, like this is a story that if you if you if you are into reggae and you know Brent very well, you know it. But it's not a story that is is, is captured um, at all, really, and doesn't have a profile in um, some of the institutions as well. So for us, it was really really important to be collecting this story and giving it that profile, but also having it as a as 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 research and. Already in the in the we we launched the archive in February, and I can talk a little bit more about how we've gone about building it. But already I've been signposting people to go in into the archives to listen to stories and testimonies from the community, and it's a real, really, real rich um, source and a rich resource for people to kind of understand the reggae history. But hearing it coming from the community as well makes it so much more powerful because it's not about us telling that story; it's given a platform to the community to share that story. Awesome. So with that, that's a great introduction to playing some three clips that have been um, created from this oral history archive. So we're going to start with Popsy, the founder of Starlight Records, and we're going to play the three clips back to back. Um, so here we go. Just bear with me while I share my screen. favorite reggae tracks um, I have so many and so many of the artists are my friends and <laughs> but um, basically I would say, well I'm, a friend, I'm also a friend a very close friend of Bob Marley so, <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll go with Bob Marley and say um, a natural mystic you know My favorite reggae tracks, um, I have so many, and so many of the artists are my friends. And <laughs> well, I always see Brent as the capital of reggae music in the, U in, in, in the UK, because Brent has turned out some great artists. Brent has turned out um, great musicians who are, are, are known worldwide, who started right here in Brent, you know, and... Um, we, 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 when I say the capital of reggae music, you know, yeah, Brent, because we had the, we had the biggest distributions of reggae music, Trojan, Palmer, Jetstar, um, we had all of these people, they were in the north. Well, I always. I think it deserves to be remembered as a, as a music that brought people together. Reggae music bring enough people together, enough cultures, enough, enough, enough um, immigrants came to England and cling to reggae. Many immigrants from other countries came to England and cling to reggae more than they cling to even pop music, the mainstream music, because it's always good to have alternatives. So I think reggae music should be remembered in the hearts then as being the capital of reggae music. You know what I mean? The capital of reggae music in the UK because they're the biggest distributor, Mr. Palmer, Jetstar Records. You know, and plus Ireland Records, just up the road there, West London. So I think North West London should be remembered as, 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 as a capital to reggae music. Awesome. So that just gives you um, a little bit of a sense. So Zurita, can you also tell us how many of these kinds of um, oral histories did you record and where we can find them? So we have 41, which are in the archive at the moment, and they are sitting on, um, uh, they're in SoundCloud, and they're also on Spotify now. If you search under Spotify under um, Brent 2020 No Base Site Home, you'll find the full list of, of um, interviews. And I think the other thing that's key to say in the three clips that you've heard, these are just really, really short excerpts of their, their interviews, and it is to give you a flavour of the type of people that are in the archive. So Popsy, if those of you who are from who, who know Halston well, he's one of two remaining record stores that have been there for 40 plus years. Um, and we've also interviewed Vivian Jones, who again is a reggae pioneer legend who lives in the borough. And it, there's many voices like Vivian that are, are in the archive as well that you can go and listen to. And then obviously General Levy, again, from Brent, international um, um, star, but also showing how the genre how the genre of reggae has then gone on to influence the subgenres, genres, particularly jungle as well. But also what you will find in the archive is, is not just high profile people from the borough, you will find interviews from people who just absolutely love reggae. Um, you'll find interviews from like local DJs, um, 
um, record collectors. There's just a huge selection of different um, interviews that you can find in the archive. Amazing. And um, for, throughout the session, we will be talking about how you went specifically about that work and building um, trust and connections within the community. So that was just to intro everybody um, what that work was about. And now I'm going to pivot over to um, Dr. Michael Riley um, to hear about your work um, in developing your years long um, film, Base Culture. So um, please let us know about um, your research and the work that you've been doing on that. Um, I'm not sure where to begin really. Um, the actual film is one of the many outputs of the project titled Base Culture and um, right at the core of the project what I'm trying to do is engage with history and heritage. We might refer to that as hidden history because it's history that is present but not seen and the whole objective of the project is to profile that history, bring it to the fore. And the visual medium, uh, especially that of film, is, is a great platform to do that. The key content of the film is really heritage um, through music and how that heritage is passed on. And uh, often one of the, the first questions is in music is what is music heritage if we're listening to it every day and so forth. But Central to this film is the voices, the memories, the experiences of black British music producers. Um, and what they're talking about is a succession of genres that have occurred all the way from the 70s to the present day. So from um, uh, actually scar all the way up to, to grime or even drill and how one genre has bounced off the influence of the other, the main influence being reggae. So many of the voices are quite young and that's really important. So it gives us um, a connection with uh, uh, the previous generations, but also it brings us up to date and it helps to understand how the music we're currently listening to, uh, listening to has been arrived at. So it's, 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 I would say it's really important. Great, thank you. I'm going to play a trailer uh, from your film. Um, and again, if you're following along with Natalie, please do make sure to pin her video so that you can follow along. For such a small island, my dad always says the small island does big things. We couldn't be further from that island, but we are so intrinsically connected in terms of fashion, in terms of language, and in terms of music. Reggae music empowers people. It's not afraid to talk about injustices. Who doesn't like reggae? Are there people that don't like reggae? It's like the coolest thing on the street. The music, the dress sense, the swagger. I don't know any other nationality on earth as cool as a Jamaican. Musically, they're the most important people on the planet. They brought a coolness that other people never had. The sense of arrogance and a sense of just boastiness. Like, I know and I'm confident within myself that I'm vibey. That's where it all started from, really. It's when you check the root of everything. It's timeless, man. Reggae is just timeless. Reggae music has had a massive influence on British culture, pop culture, fashion, everything. String dresses, bleached jeans, even just a simple bopping down the road. The clothes and the jewellery and the music, this is just a culture. 
influence. We were heavily influenced by Bashman. When I was younger, I loved Bashman and dancehall music like so much. Man's got yardy bedrooms that like, a lot of slang that we talk in our tracks come from them. Like. For me, growing up in the 90s and singing in the 90s, you know, I'm from the era where everything was very, very flossy and glossy and like big furs and cars. The vibes came straight down to us here and we just picked it and carried it on with it. I was fascinated by the bass bin. Bass that can like resonate right through you to like feeling it in your chest. Massive bass lines. That's the influence that reggae had on everything. Jamaican music run tins, I mean, it has it, birthed everything that's interesting, popular music now. Sound system culture has had a massive effect over every single sub-genre of dance music since the early 90s in the UK. I think my inspiration was like the Raga sound system thing where I was into the tapes and clashes from the, the beginning. <laughs> Here's you go versus Heartless. That was one for the books for sure. That was bringing the clash element from sound system to the garage scene, do you know what I mean? And that was kind of adopted by the grime scene. The Grime MC is, is like the end result of where we currently are. But if you follow it back, it came from the sound systems. Awesome. I hope you all enjoyed that. That looks so exciting, Michael. And I understand this is still um, ongoing, ongoing research and ongoing work, right? It is. I, I, but I should just explain uh, that for some people viewing it might have appeared to be a slideshow as opposed to, to a movie. And that's really subject to bandwidth. It is actually uh, a movie. Uh, uh, not a slideshow. I just, I just put, put that out there. Sorry but. about that. That's the the. I, I had a great viewing experience, but um, you know we will be sending out all of these resources um, through email. So I'm sorry if that didn't come out quite as clear as it should have, because it, it's honestly an amazing trailer. Um, but yeah, just please please keep going, Michael. So central to this is is the voices. Uh, uh, and particularly the young voices, creating an intergenerational conversation about the music, how it was created, and actually about the subject of history, British music history and heritage. And so it was important to uh, collaborate with the uh, production company, film production company, um, which you will have seen at the beginning, uh, fully focused, because they underpin a relationship of training and education in the technology and skills required to research, film, edit, and produce this type of content. And it's, it, that is equally important. The whole uh, understanding of the technology uh, alongside how you uh, approach history and heritage and pull it into a context where it can be shared so the whole base culture project is about doing exactly that across the various mediums, be it photography, um, film, uh, music production, and actually writing. So that whole film I actually transcribed as well, uh, because in some cases people are studying even the language that is used, the um, uh, vocabulary that's used to explain, and each generation has a different vocabulary attached to the music. And so it's quite complex on certain levels, but on the most basic level, it's a film about musicians talking about the challenges of making the music here in the UK, and actually what they've contributed to popular music in Britain and British popular music history. I have to stress that this is not a minority project. It's about popular music in the UK and the contributions made by uh, individuals that's often overlooked or referred to as hidden history. For those individuals, it's not hidden history. Um, it is their history and they engage with it on a regular basis. So the project is about disseminating, sharing and profiling that history, not just in London, not just in the UK, but internationally. Mm. And um you know, for a lot of the listeners or people that are out here that are interested in starting a heritage project, 
um, both of your projects are a bit different um, in that, um, you know, Zarita, you went about um, recruiting people, for example, to go and interview members of the community and also just interviewing people at large within the community, not necessarily the artists. Um, so Zarita, can you talk to us first about um, those initial first steps and your advice to people that might want to um, conduct a kind of community heritage project like that? Sure. So I suppose to say the first thing is with, with, no, with no base at home and the reason why the idea came around is when we were developing the bid for the London Borough of Culture, which was back in 2017, I believe, um, we did um, a lot of consultation with the community around things that they might want to see, what's special or unique about Brent. And the one thing that came up time and time again was reggae. And so right from the beginning, we knew that there was a, a wish or a, a want to kind of capture this history, document this history and celebrate this history. So with that, once we um, won the bid and started working out what this could look like, again, through constant um, consultation with lots of community groups, um, we started talking about the importance of documenting this history and what that would look like. But again, at the heart of it is looking at who we're going to go out and approach to do this um, rather than trying to tell that story ourselves um, so having for me I'd recently in 2018 I, I'd worked on the Windrush project um, for Brent Council and again that was a project that was really rooted in the community it was something where we engaged with like the older generation from the Caribbean community and we did some oral histories with them so I took that as, as a starting point of how we might go about um, developing this project and I'd say fundamentally is around building trust with the community because the community can be quite skeptical about a project like this and um, I think as Michael alluded to it that it, it may seem to the community that we think it's a hidden history and they know it's not a hidden history so there were some delicacies around how you handle that without storming in and, and being like yes we're Brent 2020 and we're going to deliver this project it's actually the conversation is we're Brent 2020 and we would like to tell this story but we want to tell the story with you because we want to tell it as authentically as possible um, so the first thing obviously we was doing lots of community engagement every time we went out and spoke about um, Brent 2020 no baseline home was part of that and I would go out and speak to people and I'd also join up with partners and find out if they were doing events and whether there was a slot for me to go and talk about the project and just start to gather interest and pull together sort of a list of expressions of interest. And then the, I suppose the second part of it was looking at how we were going to record these, these, these interviews and collect these stories. And what would be really easy is to bring someone in, a professional in, for example, and get them to conduct the interviews. But actually what we wanted to do was to provide opportunities to local people to learn a new skill if they wanted to um, and and to really kind of get in and, and 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 take part and be part of collecting these stories as well and building this archive and so we have a fantastic group of volunteers who we call um story finders we have in total um 31 volunteers um the first cohort we trained uh, we recruited for and trained last July, I think, Michael, it's July, yeah. Um, and then we did another one just before we went into lockdown. And we launched the pro project in September, as in we started building the archive in September. So after the, the, the volunteers were recruited, they were trained in interview skills. Um, and I worked with Michael um, and uh, a fantastic free, um, freelancer for, uh, who works for the BBC um, um, called John Offord, who came in and delivered some interview skill training with our volunteers and then what we did was basically allow them space to learn to practice how to do these interviews because it can be quite daunting setting up an interview for the first time um, and particularly if you don't know the subject that's the other thing to say is that it's not just reggae enthusiasts that are part of this project it's people that actually wanted to learn something about the history of the borough um, the history of the borough as well um, so in that what we would what we did was basically allowed the volunteers that were more experienced with um the with the subject to provide opportunities for them to test and rehearse use the equipment we bought equipment as well um to allow um the volunteers to do it so literally they just turn up borrow the equipment practice and then put the equipment back and once they got to a point where they were comfortable running alongside that process we also did an open call out for people who have stories and want to contribute to the archive to come forward so we we're compiling that list as well 
And then the back end of September, we um, started pairing people up and uh, um, providing opportunities for the volunteers to interview people from the community. Um, and then we, uh, so the other way that we, we also built trust and also raised the profile of the project was um, delivering these events called Base Rewind, which are engagement events, but we add it with a twist. So we put, we play, we put music on, um, we have food, entertainment, and then we, we invite someone to come and share their story. And the base rewinds that we've done have been um, really successful because, again, they're rooted in the community. So we had um, the first one we held was at BBMC Recording Studios in Wilsdon, where we had the, um, the, the, the managers of there, but also um, Diane White, who is one of the founding members of Akaboo, which is the first all-female reggae band talk about her story and her journey into reggae. The second one we did, we interviewed Paul Dawkins, again, lover's rock pioneer from the borough who shared his story with us. And most recently, we, when we launched the archive at the Jamaican High Commission, we had um, lover's rock legend, Carol Thompson and Shy One. Um, and so for those of you who might not know who Shy One is, uh, is a producer. And what was really lovely about that event was really looking at how, um, the, the generation, the impact of reggae and that intergenerational approach. So Shaiwan plays reggae, but she actually DJs in all different genres of black British music. Um, so it was really great having them two together to tell that story and, and, and really kind of reflect on, on, on their journey into, into reggae. Nice. Um, so it sounds like that community trust and, and establishing the roots all throughout the borough were really critical for getting people to trust you and being able to share their stories and also inviting a wider audience into, um, into the picture to listen to it and to participate. And um, Michael, I'm interested in, in your perspective since you are an artist, you're a practitioner, but you're also an academic and research is, um, I mean, it is what you do. So I'm interested in knowing about the, the, the tools, the specific research tools and how you sift and curate through all of this body of work um, to, to give it that meaning that, um, that it has. Um, God, uh, <laughs> I think it's, Having been an artist, I think, uh, and I should just confess up front, we have massive egos, which means that we want to see some evidence that we existed somewhere uh, beyond the release of a record or, I don't know, an event or whatever. And you look back and you see, um, you don't see a lot, actually. And you wonder, because your peers that might have been making any form of pop or rock, uh, are represented in um, and continue to be represented in uh, either books or exhibitions or some narrative, but you're not there. And especially where you might have performed on the same stage or toured uh, alongside them, you're wondering why is it that your particular contribution is absent? And so from my perspective, in terms of sifting through, it's not actually that complicated the evidence is there. You made a physical artifact, um, which is the record. The record was released and promoted. So there's newspapers, uh, there's articles, there's press cuttings. Um, there might have been a ticket to the actual gig or performance. All of these things are artifacts. The people who attended often has collected uh, these uh, items. In, in one case, um, I came across, I called her the super fan, who collected everything, including the ticket to the cloakroom, uh, where she hung a coat 30 years ago, and all the tickets to the subsequent um, uh, events that she went to. So the point here is the evidence is there. It's in the community. Um, the, the largest, uh, I think, uh, amount of evidence is the actual audience. Um, they're the ones that make all of this cult, these cultural outputs um, real. They attend. They all have memories. And perhaps the most difficult artifact to extract is the memory. And it is also the most powerful, often the most powerful component. So in terms of sifting through this, it's not actually complicated. What is difficult is negotiating that exchange. It doesn't matter whether you're asking for that ticket to the cloakroom or asking someone to recall an event from yesterday or 30 years ago. Um, 
that is denegotiation. And if you have a level of trust, it makes that easier. But one of the challenges has been actually explaining what heritage is. Um, how does it work? Um, how would you explain that um, to a funder, for example? Um, how do you respond to a heritage call? Um, and these connections are not hardwired in the community. Um, certainly research has allowed me to explore the challenges, especially within the black community, who tends to look at yesterday as yesterday, um, I'm moving towards a better future. And so often key elements of history or artifacts or heritage are disposed of for something new, something more current. And we lose the intergenerational connections of this, I think, uh, fantastic uh, collection of content. But in terms of sifting through and deciding what is what, um, we have such a rich collection of content within the Black British uh, community that's not been collected, that that is really the big decision. And lastly, I think when we look at Brent, um, I should just point to this. Trojan Records was one of those labels that started in Brent um, alongside Island Records, but Trojan underpinned kind of counterculture that goes all the way back to uh, the mods, um, the, uh, I was going to say the, the first wave of skinheads as well, but British counterculture, British subculture. So these contributions um, are not minority history they're part of British history. And the challenge is reinserting this content back into British uh, history, British music history, and the, I would say, the uh, educational curriculum. That's the challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, like putting it into the mainstream and, and making this part of the, the national story and history and, something that everybody should know about and learn about because of its significance and influence also on the wider world. Um, we, uh, yeah, I'll just yeah. And I, very yeah. Slightly and say, what is really interesting is internationally, these contributions are not recognized in the way that we think they are in the UK. Even if you have a popular record, um, I was, I'm currently creating a partnership with the Smithsonian in Washington. Um, their archive, and I'm explaining what the British have contribution, con contributed to American music. And they laughed initially. They said, is that a thing? And we had to explain what that thing is, which is exactly what we're discussing now. So it's also about how um, internationally they look at this British contribution. It's really important. And, um, and I think also just especially with No Base Like Home, um, that's creating and, and preserving and protecting a body of, of work that wasn't there before. And that's something that now generations in the future will be able to look to. Um, so just on that note, um, Zarita, if you want to share any kind of, um, do you think successes and challenges, maybe choose Choose one for each, and then I think we'll move the conversation on to funders, um, as we have Selena here to talk to us about that. Um, and for the audience, please do um, send us questions through the Q&A box, because we would love to address them after that. So yeah, Z, if you can talk to us about just a success and a challenge of No Base Like Home. Yeah, sure. I think one of the successes is actually like gaining the trust of the community. And there's still like one thing to say, this is a live program we still want more and more people to come forward and be part of the archive, but to our, our target, we're halfway through our target at the moment, um, of which is 100 oral histories. And I think getting as many as we have, which is a good sort of representation across different people. You know, if you go into our archive, you'll see that we've got stuff in there around from reggae fans. We've got people, that, we've got interviews in there from DJs and producers. We've got um, interviews in there from pioneering artists and also women and I, and I also feel that like we launched this at the Jamaican High Commission back in February and I suppose just picking up on what Michael was saying is that it's a history that 
that we know in this in and and, to, and we know in the black community not not it's not as widely documented known outside of the black community but even outside of the uk in, in terms of like jamaica they they are aware but don't really know so launching this archive at the high commission and being able to share with them the work and also all of the stuff around brent and having their support in, in being able to, to share this work back to Jamaica as well is a huge success. Nice. And would you say, what was the toughest thing about getting getting this oral history archive online? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> or just something that people, when they're embarking on a heritage project, should be aware of a challenge that they might encounter themselves. I think one of the strengths, but also a challenge, is time um time and networks as well so you know the time that it might take you might think that oh i'll just do this and it'll be quite quick but actually the time it does take to coordinate all of these interviews so to coordinate the availability of volunteers because if you know volunteers are given their time for free and you have to work around their commitments also trying to get the contributors to agree a time and a location that's suitable so that that is one of one of the challenges and i think also um Another challenge is also when you're conducting the interview is how long the interview goes on for. And Michael and I have done some work on this because um, some, of our in, some of our early interviews um, can go on for a long time. Um, a lot, and, a lot, and, and there's nothing wrong with that because people want to share their story. But when you've got probably 90 minutes worth of content that has to be then edited, that can be quite challenging. What the other thing just to say is that with the archive, they sit on the digital archive, but all of the archives also sit in Brent Museum and Archive because we want this to be a legacy for the borough and to sit within the borough's archive as well. So when people in the future are doing research, they can go into the borough archive and, and, and put it out as a physical piece of work. That's great. Um, all right, so now we are going to talk about um, the practicalities of this and also how funding bodies can help in setting up these kinds of projects. So uh, we have Selena Papa here from the National Heritage Lottery Fund, and I know that some of her colleagues are in the background and that they will be sharing a PowerPoint presentation. So um, Selena, why don't you introduce yourself and whoever is managing the presentation can get that um, set up right now. Thank you ever so much. And I think I really, um, I think Michael and Zarita have really touched on all the key issues that are important to us as a funder. I'll give a bit of background to where our money comes from because it will give you a sense of why projects like Money Based Like Home and others are so important to us. We, for the last 25 years, we've been distributing um, in uh, lottery ticket sale um, good cause money. So if there are any lottery players out there in the audience, we have to thank you because it's your contributions that have helped us to fund so much heritage over the last 25 years. And we are the largest funder of heritage in the UK. So the, one of the questions was why is supporting the documenting and celebrating of black British heritage so important? Um, I think Michael of Zarita have told, have told us why, because we in future, we want the historians, the researchers to look into those records and hear those stories. It's not just the artifacts and the physical objects. It's the people that were there that made that story happen. And that's really important to us. Because we distribute lottery money, it's really important to us that we fund the full breadth of UK heritage. And that includes Black British heritage, of course, and many other heritages that sometimes aren't represented as much as they should be in the mainstream collections, archives, you know, curriculums that we have. We also want people to enjoy that heritage now. So as well as creating a legacy, we want people to enjoy, engage, learn from, you know, share the heritage right at this moment. And so we look for that in our projects too. It's really important to say that we don't define heritage. You know, as Sarita has explained, we like you to define it and you might need some support with that, you know, some facilitation, some, some confidence building to actually understand that your story is important as part of our national story. And I know certainly from generations of my family that it can be quite difficult to understand how your story fits into the national narrative when all the time we are bombarded with, you know, institutions, collections, narratives that we don't see ourselves in and we work very hard at the front to try and turn those as much as we can. So yeah, so there's our definition of heritage on the slide. We don't have one. We want you and your communities to tell us what's important to you. Um, 
you'll know some of you will know the kinds of things we funded we'll just show you a few of the projects we funded um, over the last 25 years uh, right from projects at, at, you know in the millions of pounds um, supporting major kind of capital works and major new collections through to um, uh, individuals who have important archive collections of their own so leon robinson he was the first individual owner of heritage that we awarded because he had a collection that related to the clark brothers so that's that's an individual that we funded uh, we've also funded um what's the next one the london calypso tent so you may know Ale alexander de great so we funded a small project there to capture some of the stories of london calypsonians there weren't many and he did encounter some of the challenges that the reader has pointed out but it was it was a really good engagement project um, uh, for the um, association of calypsonians and it's left its legacy because they produced a book as well alongside that so that's just a few examples of the things that we have funded um, oh and, and one more grime more than forest so i just mentioned that and that's a very small youth-led project um, that azarita has um explained uh, for No Space Like Home, just got young people interviewing the producers, the artists, you know, the important people for Walden Forest grime story, and then leaving that legacy in their local archive in terms of the recorded oral histories. I think they collected some objects and artifacts as well. So it's just really important to us as a funder that we help you find ways to secure the legacy of the engagement uh, work that you're doing um, in Heritage. It's important to say that we're aware as a funder that our funding hasn't always reached the communities that we would like it to reach, which is why we're here today and is why we have engagement teams that come to these events. We know we haven't invested as much in Brent um, as we would like to have invested and we know some of the reasons why that is. We've heard them from you. We've seen it in the low amount of applications we've had. We know that some of those issues are to do with how our processes are structured. So those of you that have tried to get funding from us before, you'll be aware of our previous processes. We're in a new world now. We have a new funding strategy, a new approach, and we'd like to start a conversation with Brent organisations today um, through Zarita and her colleagues to find out what's important to you, because we are committed to investing in Brent organisations until 2024, even post COVID. In fact, we're even more determined to invest in Brent. So we'd like to start that conversation um, with Brent organisations tell us what heritage your community values that'll help us think about how do we invest in that heritage going forward some of you may know that like other funders because of the pandemic we've had to pause our open programs so we haven't got an open pot of money for anybody to apply to but we're hoping to structure something special for brent and enfield and newham if you're from those boroughs uh, for the next six to 12 months. So um, please do think about the heritage that's important to you. And I think we've got another slide that just gives you a sense of what this heritage could be. And Zarita and Michael have touched on some of those things. It could, it's people's memories and experiences. We fund a lot of those kinds of um, projects. Cultural traditions, stories, festivals, the crafts that are important to your community, the music and the dance traditions that are important to you. Not forgetting nature, you know, nature, landscape, places, built heritage, archaeology really is so broad. We'd like you to tell us what's important to you so that we can find a way to support your projects. Um, and I think that's all I had to say. So we really look forward to engaging with you much more over the next of the next few months. Thank you, Selena. Um, and what, what's the best way of, of being able to find out more is that um, through your website or um, I suppose, yeah, through, through Brent 2020, you know, we can open those channels of communication. Yeah, we're going to, so, so absolutely, yes, please do follow us on Twitter and sign up to um, our newsletter. We'll send you those links after the event, but we will absolutely be um, continuing the conversation with Zarita and colleagues in the Borough of Culture team to find out what's the best way to engage with groups over the next few months. So um, if you're from Brent, we will, we will find a way to talk to you. If you're not from the Borough of Brent, um, what we'll do is we will kind of leave you some contact details after this event so you can just get in touch with us if you'd like to find out the current situation with our funding. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so we're now gonna move into the Q&A uh, side of this conversation. Um, so please feel free to continue to send your questions. Um, I do see, let's see, they are coming in. Um, uh, all right, so 
Um, there's so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> So let's start uh, here from an attendee. Um, so this was, I guess, one of the starting points is why do you think this history is so hidden seeing that reggae plays such a pivotal role in British music history? Do you want me to respond or? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, <laughs> that, that requires a book potentially, but, um, but yeah, if you have a few sentences to respond to that. I think we, we have two things happening in parallel. One is um, if the culture uh, from what the music emanates is regarded as minority, there is a, there's a lag in the take up of that contribution across all fields. So in the first instance, you get less press, you get less coverage, coverage you get less promotion. Even in, when you're in the charts, um, there is less support for that. Uh, once it's happened, once it's occurred, that is, if we take one track, um, after that, there's a gap in information until someone else comes along and is relatively profiled. Uh, if no one is writing that up in terms of academia, and this is one of the things that I discovered when I uh, accessed academia, Academia is one of those spaces that converts that event into text, into a book. That book then gets researched and regurgitated in terms of reports. Um, it might even contribute to the way Heritage Lottery responds to a particular location or the people in those locations. So academia plays a specific role. The black community has not been in that position in academia to drive that um, narrative forward. But the wider, um, I think, community in terms of the heritage community has not considered that contribution sufficiently important in the first instance. So there's a, you know, there's an accumulative effect here um, that means that that heritage gets overlooked and it's passed to the community to drive it forward. If the community is preoccupied with holding down a job and just trying to put food on the table, then it's not going to happen. And when we look at certain minority communities, that is the case. They have other priorities. And so we're now looking at trying to go back in time, uh, decades in some instances, to collate, well, identify, collate, negotiate with, the, with, with that heritage and the owners of that heritage, negotiate to move that heritage into spaces where it can be processed and wider disseminated. And that is an ongoing challenge. We talked about the challenge in Brent, but actually it's nationally. Thank you. Um, and let's see what's coming through here. So uh, there's one question, how difficult did you find it um, getting into the community, specifically less well-known players in the Brent reggae story to come forward and contribute to the project? And was there any resistance? Um, Zarita, maybe you might answer this question. I mean, yes. You don't have to name names, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and potentially still will be resistance in the future, but um, I have to say that like just having some amazing community contacts has really helped and amazing story finders that's the other thing that some of the story finders that the volunteers come from the reggae community um and so some of them might you know i'm going to give a shout out to a couple of them that might be on this so patricia walton who is um also known as dj as blaze from chalk hill community radio station she's very embedded in the community so with some of the people that were resistant because at the end of the day as, as i said before being being a council and the potentially people feeling like who are we to tell the story when we weren't there we didn't live it um those people in the those real advocates for the project have been the ones that have been going out saying no this is a really good thing and this is a chance to document our history and take ownership and if you know don't push against it type thing be part of be part of the story because we want your voice into it in, in this story and that's how we've been able to kind of um bend and turn and get people to contribute to the archive and really kind of um, feel, feel that it's for them, feel that they are recognized and, and part of it. And just the other thing to say, Letitia, that I didn't mention is that the, we also have a reggae map. So if you go onto 
to the No Base Light Home um, page on the Brent 2020 website, you'll see that we've started to create a reggae map with different pins which showed different iconic things that happened across the borough. So things like the four blue plaques, the record shops, the production, the record labels. Um, and again, that is something that is growing and that map was built with the community and many of the images that you'll see on that map were images that were given to me by the community. Thank you. And um, so there's one question here about how, oh yeah. I'll interject very quickly, because there's a point Please, that yeah. you mentioned, which is that the heritage organization and funders and even the council are regarded as the enemy. I just have to put it out there. And so a major challenge is getting over that hump where the community regards the very institutions that could support as the enemy. And that has to be negotiated very carefully because often there's a history there, another hidden history, if you like, that comes to the fore and we have to negotiate that in order to get to the particular heritage that we're trying to profile. I absolutely agree with that. And I think that's why um, certainly um, as an organ at the fund, um, we, we could because we because we're accountable for the lottery money we have to have a strategy for how we're going to deliver that funding over a certain period and built into our new strategy um our, our new mechanisms for delivering the investment so for example um, so it's not just you come to us we give you the money and that just doesn't help at all um with that kind of the balance of the relationship because it is the heritage of the community it's it's you know we're actually just investing in that we don't hold the purse but we have these new mechanisms now in our funding. So community grants, for example, you know, the potential for organisations to get a pot of money that you deliver locally, you make those decisions, you design the processes that suit um, the local community and you and you we can fund you to actually bring in some of the capacity you might need to broker some of those and those conversations that you need at the beginning. So we're, we're trying to be much more responsive as a funder to the local needs by changing how we how our mechanisms work because we are absolutely recognize and that is the structures and the processes that sometimes leave us feeling excluded and i say this because before i worked arrived at the fund four years ago i was actually a grant holder so i was actually a, i came from a small community organization i was there for about you know 12 years trying to get money from funders and i felt the impact of sometimes of those structures that stood in front of you so yeah, so please let's start a conversation because I think that's the best place to start. Thanks. Um, so there's also another question, um, and I suppose this uh, about how this project has changed um, Brent heritage and archiving policies, how we go about it. But maybe the question there is um, Zarita in particular, how would you see, um, or I mean to both of you, Michael as well, how do you see this um, oral history archive being used in the future? What, what do you see as the, the legacy and the future of this project? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, obviously, as I said, I'd like, it needs to be in the Brent Museum and Archive because having done the Windrush exhibition, for example, um, we noticed that there was there wasn't a, there wasn't a clear representation of a lot of Black British history in Brent Museum and Archive. Um, so this this history absolutely has to sit sits within that archive. But I think it also provides and it, and it's not nothing new that the, that the Museum and Archive Service do work like this. They do do community projects and community outreach projects. But I think what No Baseline Home shows is that there's a real need and a want to be um, capturing Black British history but also building it with the community and shaping what that project is as well. And I think that's what we've done, how we've approached it differently is that we had a brief, but we went out and we shaped it. And I suppose in terms of the question around the legacy is, I want this to be used, as I said, in two, five, 10 years where people want to know about the history of, of reggae in the borough and the artists and can go and listen to the archive and hear from people like, Chips Richards from um, Trojan, Clem Bushy, a producer, um, Trevor Starr, uh, session, Trojan session musician, they can all hear their testimonies of what life was like and how they really sort of laid the foundations for changing, um, well, for, for Black British music, really. And I suppose the other thing is I'd like to see the archive also being used by some of the, the national institutions I'd like to be opening up a conversation with the bigger institutions about our archive being part of some of their their work as well 
I'll just come back on that quickly and say also um, the the other uh, component there is the university. The university. It's nineteen hours. Oops, that's my computer talking to me. <laughs> um, uh, um, the University of Westminster is also in Brent, and I think what I'm trying to do in partnership with uh, Brent and Zaretha is provide that link uh, to another building or institution that's considered uh, impenetrable, impenetrable. So the whole idea is to capture this in as many spaces, um, in as many forms as possible that will allow for it to be revisited in the future. And the university and that whole idea of writing stuff down and putting it into books is all part of that heritage program. Yeah, for sure. And um, Michael, there's a very specific question to you, which is where and when can we see Michael's film? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> the people want to know. <laughs> it's going to be available through the No Base Flight Home project. So if you stay tuned to that, you'll be able to see it. Um, we're also negotiating a part two um, with a major TV broadcaster. So stay tuned to Zaretha and No Base Light Home if you'd like to find out more about that. That sounds really exciting. And um, and yeah, we will definitely send the link to the trailer so that you can watch it properly on all of your own devices, full bandwidth, high definition, um, so that you can really get the most out of that. Um, we are coming to time at seven o'clock. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists, our speakers today, um, Zarita, Michael, and Selena. And thank you, Natalie, our BSL interpreter. Um, and thanks to everybody in the audience for your questions. We really hope that this has been um, interesting and um, just giving you ideas for what you might want to do in your own personal heritage projects um, and how uh, you know, a funding body can help and support that. Um, so with that, uh, just the follow up next steps. Um, early next week, you'll receive um, a transcript of this conversation as well as the recording um, and the resources that have all been discussed. Um, of course, the Spotify playlist to the oral history archive so that, um, you know, you can really spend some time listening to that and just sharing it more widely within the community, because it's really important to share that, um, especially since Brent in particular is being really hardly affected by COVID and a lot of these members that have been recorded are part of this part of our Brent community. So it's important that we share and listen and um, pass on their stories as well. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any final words, <laughs> um, otherwise I'm gonna close. Thank you. Great, all right.